Okay, let's get started. So we have um, we started covering contact on Monday. And so this was contact. Um, and even though we had cylindrical and spherical objects, you know, we were working with that. Okay, all right. Somebody help Jack out with the stable. Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? All right, so, so getting this idea of coincident points. All right, I need your attention up here. Okay. All right. But always, if you got to talk or something like that, feel free to leave um, and do the important things out there. So, um, coincident points that are in contact with each other have some specific properties that we dealt with. And so, as a quick review on that, um, when you have contact points, those are by definition an instantaneous point. Okay, and so that's the weird part about this. And then there was this weird point in between, right? In between or coincident with those points, called a path point that is not an instantaneous point. Okay, but when we've got points on rigid bodies, we have to treat them that way. And so we set that up last time, and y'all did a problem that was a wheel that was slipping. Okay, and it could it could slip in two different ways, right? That combo in which we had right sliding, translational sliding, or rotational sliding, slipping, I guess I should say, right? Or that combination of both. Okay, now today we're gonna take those ideas and we're gonna start to constrain this now. So this is where the constraint comes in, because last time we had no constraints, we just had contact. Thank you. And so now to actually get this to roll we have to add constraints, okay? And the reason why is because the translational motion is connected to the rotational motion, right? Does that, that make sense, right? We ended by saying that we had this equation, which was P is equal to N minus N, right? So what were these parts? Is the degrees of, degrees of freedom, right? So the number of degrees of freedom. What is n? Motion variables. Motion variables. I think I got this wrong. It's n, right? Is it n equals p minus m? No, I have p equals n minus m. You have p equals n minus m. Let's let's just go with that because that's what I said last time. But no, it's the number of degrees of freedom is equal to the number of motion variables. This was x double dot or x dot and theta dot are our motion variables, right? That's actually what's creating motion, right? And we can differentiate those into the double dots. And then we're going to subtract m, which is what? Constraints. Number of constraints. Good. All right, before we launch into this, what causes a constraint? Okay, you're bound by something. Okay, these are, and so these are motion constraints. Okay, these are constraints on motion. Okay, so I'm standing on the floor right now. Am I constrained? Yeah. Okay, how am I constrained? By the floor. I'm constrained by the floor, right? Okay. Yeah, right. So I, I'm not sliding either, right? So I'm not slipping. Okay, so you're exactly right. I'm constrained by the floor, and I'm also not sliding. Okay, so the carpet is constraining me. You know, if I could, I could push, you know, different directions, I'm not doing the splits. Okay, so in statics, y'all were dealing with constraints and probably didn't even realize it. Right, so we got the classic cantilever beam here. What did you do when you needed to find forces on this cantilever beam? What did you do? You needed to analyze that beam. Free body? Yeah, you did a free body diagram. Exactly. So when you do a free body diagram, you can't leave me, right? Get some loading here. All right, help me do it. More on this free body diagram. What's that? Is there force on the wall? Is there? We got a moment. We got a moment. So we're gonna have a force, a force here. Okay. Right. And we're guessing on the direction. Okay. There's some force there. What else do we have? A moment. Yeah. Right, so we you, know, you draw that moment there, right, to resist that levered force on the end. And then what else? There's one more. 
a curse under the wall. You got an axio force, right? Okay. So what do we do? We took away the wall and we replaced it by constraint forces. That's exactly what you did. So anytime that we have a motion constraint, there is a force that's causing that constraint to exist. Okay. So with an example on the floor, okay, I am constrained. I can't fall through the floor. And so I can't fall through the floor because there's a force that's pushing up on me from the floor. Right? Okay, hope this is a nice simple concept. And I just wanted to say, you do, you've done this all the time, okay, without even realizing it, is this is a motion constraint. In statics, you have motion constraints. Yes, mm -hmm. right? How many degrees of freedom are in this system? Zero, right? So this equation right here, the number of constraints is equivalent to the number of motion variables that we have on this object. Because when left unconstrained, if this is the beam, how many motion variables do you have? A lot. We live in a three-dimensional world. Three. Okay. <laughs> a lot. All right, so ex extrapolate that on for you. For you. Okay, we live in a three-dimensional world. So how many potential motion variables do you have? Three. Three? Five. We have three for a particle. Okay, right? What are those three motion motions it can it can have? Meditation, perception, and rotation. Wrong. <laughs> but those are fun words to say. Okay. All right. All right. What what can this particle do? It can the sail out. Up and down, left and right. Up and down, left and right. Okay, and in and out. Right. If we're using a Cartesian coordinate system, right. Okay. If we're using a polar coordinate system, right. We get some other things, but there's three. Okay. Now we're in rigid bodies. Okay, so now that we're in rigid bodies, how many motions are possible? Motion variables. Six, right? Because we've got three translations and three rotations. Okay, so for this beam, okay, to be completely constrained, you've got to come up with six constraints that are keeping it from moving for there to be zero degrees of freedom. Okay, all right, so now let's, let's apply this concept to a two-dimensional wheel, okay? So cross-section of the football, right? Cross-section of the football, and we're gonna figure out what to do with this. And where do they come from? Because now we've got to allow it to move in some ways. Is anything ever not constrained? Is anything ever not constrained? Good question. Anybody? Is anything ever not constrained? Stuff in space? Stuff in space, yeah. That, I mean, that's exactly where I go to as well. Uh, trajectory motion, right? This is, this is actually not constrained as well, right? Any type of flight that you've got. Um, there's a force on it, okay? In space, it, you know, it can be unconstrained. And are there forces? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are yeah. yeah, right? Massive objects around it create a gravitational pull. So we've got, we still have forces, but we don't have constraints. Okay, if you're tumbling. Okay, so now um, let's get into this contact phenomenon. Um, okay. Let's deal with these motion variables before we get into a rigorous definition of of rolling contact, okay? So we said earlier, I don't have my chalk with me, but remember we had a path, okay? We're rolling now, two-dimensional rolling. So we're trying to connect theta dot and x dot, okay? I think you've got some intuition on this. How could we connect them? Do you have any intuition on this? No. No, zero. Okay, there's rolling, it just happens. Okay, so if we've got moving, Okay, we got rolling constraints. We know that the things that are causing this constraint is a force from the table that's a normal force, okay? And then a force from the table that's a friction force, okay? You have to have friction. You have to have static friction to have rolling, okay? That can't occur without friction, okay? Because otherwise we have 
slipping, right? And that's kinetic friction. So now in the rolling, let's take away this instantaneous point idea. We'll come back to that in a moment, okay? Because that's what connects it all. But let's talk about the circumference of the, the object and then the path that it traces out. Can you tell me something about the path on the object and the object that it's on, on the rolling object, and then on the object that it's on? What's true about the path? They're the same length, okay? They have to be the same length. And so if we take, take the football, we take the object, and we roll it all the way around, Okay, and when I say all the way around, we've gone 360 degrees. Okay, what is this path length? Circumference. Is the circumference of the football? Okay, or the arc length? Okay, arc length as it as you navigate 360 degrees. Okay, what is the circumference of the football? Very pi delicious. What? Pi <laughs> diameter. Yeah, pi is pi, pi. <laughs> right? It's pi b, right? Good. Or pi two r, two r pi, right? And so, fantastic. So, um, so those path lengths are the same with each other, all right? And so, what we find out as we're tracing out, right, this arc length as it goes around, okay, that's our pi b, okay. Um, and so, we have a relationship there, and often it's just stated as this. X dot is equal to R theta dot. Okay, and that comes from starting with the arc length. So whereas X is going to be R theta. Okay, is this, would you agree with this? R theta, right? So we're saying that this is our arc length. This is our path that we're tracing out. I take the time derivative. Okay, and then we get x dot is equal to r theta dot. Fantastic. Okay, so if we only cared about two dimensional, very normal rolling on non moving surfaces, we would just stop here and we would move on. Okay. But that's not actually what we're after, right? We're looking for something more general because otherwise, how do you do this? Right. See what I'm getting at? Okay. So we have to come up with a, a, a more rigorous definition of that. Okay. I do want you, <clears throat> I do, however, want you to see that this is a, okay, this is what's called a configuration constraint. And then this is actually a motion constraint. And so a configuration constraint means that, okay, it's, it's oriented, okay, and it's oriented and I want to maintain that orientation. A motion constraint, now we're actually in dynamics, right? We're constraining motion, right? And I'm going to draw a line between those two. And the reason why is because differentiating a configuration constraint only works in two dimensions. Okay, this is a two-dimensional concept to go from here to there. In three dimensions, you can't do it. Okay, and so, and, and that's for a bunch of things that we're not going to talk about. So when you're doing motion constraints, I want you to be thinking, how can I get dots on my variables? Okay, and the, the way to do it, the best way to do it is to start with dots on your variables, to start with speed variables because they're motion variables that you're constraining. Okay, please nod your head if you're with me on that. This is a dynamics class, it's not a statics class, okay? And the good news is that once you have a motion constraint or a velocity constraint, okay, you can take the time derivative of it, always. You can always take the time derivative of it. And then that gives you, just take the time derivative here, what do we get? It's double dot is equal to r theta double dot, okay? You can get an acceleration constraint. And so 
this is all kinematics, okay? Generally, I want you to start here. There's a force that causes that. You take a time derivative, you get an acceleration constraint. And then when we apply this to F equals MA, our Newton and our Euler equations, this is actually our extra equation, okay? So we've got number of motion variables. We've got a number of constraints. Well, this is actually the constraint that we want. Okay, so that's where we're headed to. All right, so let's get into, um, for what we know about rigid bodies, okay? So we gotta get into our points to develop this. All right, so knowing what we know about two points on a rigid body, okay, we've already developed that we have BO, we got our point BA, or BN rather, but we got our point NB. Okay. And on the rigid body, if we want to find the velocity, okay, the velocity of BN, okay, that's an instantaneous velocity. All right, so this is our contact. And then I'm finding this, I'm going to put whatever frame. So this is an F. So F here means whatever frame we want to use. Okay. And so this idea, right, there's some F frame somewhere. I want to do my BO velocity and BO in the end. And I'm going to add to that omega from F. Whoops, this needs to be F. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, F to B, F cross with R from B O to B N. Okay. And so what we've made this, we've made that generic form that we used last week on the robot. Okay. I want to observe it from the A frame. This formula works. I want to observe it from the F frame. I want to observe it from the D frame, whatever it may be. And then this is our instantaneous. Okay. And we, we know, we now know and love this equation. Okay. Um, we can calculate our acceleration as well by right? using that, uh, using that next equation. All right. So now, Let's do the same thing, okay? And instead of doing the point on B in, I mean the point on B that's touching in, let's do the point on N that's touching B. So we have our velocity on N touching B, okay? From the any frame, that also is an instantaneous point. Okay, back to that concept from last time. So there's our contact. We have our velocity of what? What point do you want to start on? Start with on our again. Just pick some other point on it. Okay. Yeah, let's do that now, right? So NO, NF plus omega F to N cross with R of N sub B. Uh, in, in O to N sub B. Okay. All right. But we have to do this because N sub B and B sub N are contact points. All right. So we're going to need these in just a moment. So just keep this in mind. Now I'm going to write up the definition of rolling. Okay. Because I've already told you this is not the definition of rolling. This is what you get from a definition of rolling in two dimensional in two-dimensional rolling, okay? And so here is the definition of rolling. We're not gonna drive it. I think there is a derivation in your book that, that has this. So, so here's our definition. It is the velocity of B in N is equal to the velocity of the point in B. Okay. These two instantaneous points are equal to each other. And then when we say that we have the velocity of something, you always have to ask the question what? From whose perspective? From whose perspective? Okay. From whose perspective? And so I'm going to write up here this perspective. You pick your frame. 
but they've got to be the same. All right. And so this is rolling, okay, the definition of rolling. The velocity of the instantaneous point Bn is equal to the velocity, the velocity of the instantaneous point Nb. Okay. And so this is the any frame. Okay. And this is a this is just kind of a, a cool concept. Okay. That means you can observe the velocity of either one of those instantaneous points, right? Which is weird all, all by itself, okay? From any frame you want, and they're gonna be equal to each other. And so um, why, um, so, so what's the easiest frame on this problem? What's the easiest frame to use on this problem? N. N, okay. Well, let's work this problem using our frame N. And and we'll we'll get this done with rolling, okay? If you were to rotate that sphere, is N is N B also translating on the horizontal? If I'm gonna say that again, this guy right here. Yeah, if you were to rotate that about the uh, like uh, put that, I know what you mean. And then yeah, so clockwise, B N rotate up the left side. Would it? Yeah, so be in. Or so, are you just choosing new points? At yes, we're choosing new points. Okay. So okay. even, and then let me draw this diagram. To, so to, isn't the velocity of those two zero? Depends who you ask. Okay. So let's do that. If you've got, okay, just to be clear about this, I've got point B in right there. Okay. And in our problems, we've had a point B1 that's right here. Okay. This is point B in. And that's point B1. And so this is, you know, while we, we have some sort of theta, uh, well, let's say that's zero. Theta is equal to zero, actually. Okay, there's no rotation at all. And then I rotate this, okay? Then what we have here is we have a new position of our, of our wheel, right? And then where is B1 on this now? We've now rolled it a little bit. Where it's yeah, it's got closer to the bottom, right? It's, let's just say it's right there. Let's say BN is actually horizontal to BO. Okay, it's on the same vertical axis. Where is, I'm sorry, BN, B1 is right there. Sorry about that. B1 is horizontal. Where is BN? Has it, has it been moved up the side? No. No, it hasn't. We've got a brand new BN point. Okay. It's a brand new BN point. Where is NB in this first? It's right there with the BN. Where is NB after we rotated it, after we've rolled it? It's in the, that spot right there. Okay, but B1, you can see B1 has moved with the body. Point P is still right in the it's the contact. Yeah, point P is with them as well, but it's not an instantaneous point. And so, so what's actually happening right here with B1, okay, as this happens, it's actually kind of down here. Do you see what path it's tracing out? Have you ever seen that? Yeah, a sine wave. So it's not, it, it's, uh, it looks like a sine, okay, but it's not. It's actually, there's a name for it, do you know? It does that type of thing over and over and over and over. It's called a cycloid. Okay, that's a cycloid path. Something unique to, unique to rolling. Okay, it's kind of a, just a cool phenomenon. All right, so that answer your question. So BN doesn't move up the side. Yeah, BN. I, I just don't understand why those velocities are. Oh, got it. Well, there, there's, a, there's a derivation of that. We're, we're not going to prove that, okay? Right now, we're just going to say this is the rule if it's rolling. So now let's find, let, let's actually find what we got to do here. Um, let's apply this definition. Okay, what frame do you want to observe it in? Somebody said it earlier. Same thing. Oh, someone said that. Yeah. Why would you want to observe this in it? I mean, I can pick whatever frame we want. Okay. I don't want to be right No. It's in the frame of one of the. Okay. It's, it's, it's in the frame of one of these, right? Okay. I think it's a great idea. So if we do this, okay, you write down your definition of rolling. You choose a frame. Okay. There is no wrong frame. Okay. There are better frames to choose than others, but I, I would choose in also, right? So what can we do here immediately in this formula? We can simplify this equation. 
How do we do it? So n and then b goes to zero. We what? The n and or n b and n goes to zero. That's zero. Okay. Now here's here's the answer to Jack's question. He's like, well, isn't that zero? Well, yeah, one side of it is zero. Okay. What about this? Well, it must be zero. Well, they're equal to each other. Okay. But what can we do here? I've got a point on B, and how do we how, what, how do we characterize? It? What is that? That equation. We use that equation, right? The equation that we know and love. So here, I'm going to on this side, I'm going to substitute the equation, some velocity of B in in in, which means I need to start at some point on B and then go find the velocity of B in. So I'm going to choose the point B O in in plus omega from n to b cross with r from b o to b n is equal to zero right the zero vector this just helps I, I i want you to just do that it helps you remember that this is instantaneous it's an instantaneous point okay all right so what do we have here Let's parameterize this. Okay, I'm going to erase these guys. So from NO to NB, I have X, right? And theta, I think, is in that direction. Okay. So what is the velocity of BO in N? Don't calculate it last time. So it's X down, X naught. What direction? So up here, right? In Y, do we have? Bx going out this direction, I think. Yes. That was by. Uh, Bx goes to the right and down. Okay, so this is by. Okay, yeah, got it. Okay, then Bx. Okay, got it. Thanks. So x dot in what direction? Negative. Bz. Bz. X dot in the bz direction. Oh, never mind. I was thinking about it. That's kind of weird. Okay, x dot in the what? In x. In x direction. Great. Okay. Then what? Plus, what was our omega? Negative theta dot in z. That was our negative theta dot. Okay, in the in z, b z direction, right? Then what? Negative r in the n y. Cross with negative r in y is equal to. Cool, All right? All right, so now what do we do? Let's just work it out. All right, I've got x dot in x direction plus cross product here, r, theta dot, and then negative signs cancel out. In z crossed with in y is negative in x equal to the zero vector. Okay, we're getting somewhere, right? Now we divide, we divide through by in x, right? No, okay, we don't, right? What do we do? We dot it, right? We dot the whole thing within X. When we dot the whole thing within X, I'll move it up here soon, so y'all in the back can see this. Uh, we get X dot minus R theta dot is equal to zero. And then we get, we do the same thing to both sides. X dot is equal to R theta dot. Okay. So that's how you derive the constraint. That's how we derive that rolling constraint in two dimensions. That's okay. it. Yeah. Okay. Great question. All right. This is based on two instantaneous points. And although it's based on two instantaneous points, when we do our substitutions in here, we end up with a scalar equation, okay? And so we, we've, we've abandoned points once we're into the math, okay? And we only have scalar equations of motion variables. So then you're asking yourself the question, I mean, these are continuous variables. These are continuous motion variables, right? 
Theta is continuous. X is continuous. R is constant. Right? So these are good as long as it's rolled up. As soon as it starts to slip, you need different equations, which you calculated on Monday. Isn't everything always slipping though? No. Nope. R time? No. There's there's motion. Let me put it this way. Okay, like there's motion, but there are points that are in contact that are not slipping always. And so there we have to kind of pull out and, and we're in rigid body. So right now we're in rigid body mechanics. Now I got a flat football right here. Okay, just like that soccer ball last time. There's a contact patch. Okay, and in that contact patch, that's actually what's happening underneath of a tire. So with a contact patch, there are points that aren't slipping. Okay, but then there's deformation that's occurring in the tire. Okay, and it's not just deformation this way. We've got shear deformation. Let's go back to mechanics and materials. Okay. Why is there wear? Why do the car tires wear that if it's not just if it's not slipping? It's because of the the shear. So I mean, no, no. So I don't want to say. So do car tires always not slip? No. But for you to have traction, there has to be portions of that tire that aren't slipping. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. I mean, like in this ideal world, if we could just always have pure rolling, yeah, there would be no wear. You're exactly right. And so this, and so this affects a lot of things. So, so there's, there's a, a car tires are important, and this is incredibly important for uh, bearings. So for designing bearings um, in any type of system that you've got, because that is by definition something with friction. And so you can reduce the motion in bearings by designing the bearing the right way. Um, and there's, there's some, some well-established methods of this. So your bearings will last longer. Whether you're talking about ball bearings, spherical bearings, um, or other like slip rings and things like that as well. Okay, so this, is, this has immense application to engineering design. Okay, like car tire. I was just looking up winter tires for my new van. Just, you know, it's about time. <laughs> Those things are not cheap. <laughs> but I, I, want, I want my vehicle to not slip as much uh, in the winter when it comes. And I was thinking, uh, I'm going to be paying a lot of money and two years from now, hope it makes it through two seasons. <laughs> right. Is it four wheel drive? It's not. No, it's a two wheel drive. So rear wheel. So I can get it. Uh, converted. I can get it converted. Yeah, for like a. For like fourteen thousand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I looked into it. There's an outfit called Quigley. Uh, in Pennsylvania that does it. There's also a spot in Salt Lake City. And uh, we drove up, uh, drove my kids in the suburban uh, with a bunch of dads from their school up, uh, uh, up a pass, which was a blast. There's a four wheel drive road. I, I didn't escape damage to uh, my, uh, my, my steps on the side, um, but that's fine. Those are coming off anyway. But anyway, the whole time I was driving up, I was thinking, man, I'd love to do this at that that van, that Nissan NV. Like, wouldn't that be cool? Like, you get up to this this pass, like next to Gray's Gray's Peak. We can see Gray's Peak out there, and um, and just be like, I drove a bus <laughs> <laughs> this pass. And uh, yeah, so I've I had I have visions of grandeur. The same way I want to put a diesel engine in it one day, which is also like fifteen thousand dollars. So, so if, if 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 you all would just pay more in tuition. <laughs> no. then, then, then I, I, I can afford these things. I don't know what your problem is. <laughs> so, all right. so when you say put it in the four wheel drive, are they putting the engine in it? No, you'd have to. It's it's everything. So, so you yeah, fix it, the mechanics. So you, yeah, your so your torque converter yeah. and how your differentials work. I mean, you have to change. You have to change everything. Yeah, so, but it's a new engine as well, right? No, no, no it's, and it's the same engine. So you can you can do it with a V six or V eight that's in it. Um, and so it just it, it's all about the bottom side of the engine um, and what you're doing with the differentials, like I said, the torque converter and, and changing all that. So interesting. Yeah. Any warranties go out the window, but who cares? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. So this makes sense. If it doesn't, that's fine. Can you use this formula? Okay. All right. Yeah. So um, I guess that like V and the NB is always like it's on the same body. Uh -huh. Why it like visually it doesn't make it much sense to me that N O to N B. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that velocity is zero. And that velocity is zero. 
Okay, great question. So, so Tom's asking the question, why did we just cross this thing out and just ignore it? Okay. Yeah, so, so it's a point that's fixed in in, right? So this is the, it's not a point that is, it's not a point that's moving on in. That would be the path point, okay? This does not work if that's P, okay? That is not true, okay? The velocity in N of the, in, of the path point is not equal to the velocity of the N, okay? That would be the path point. This is a point that is, okay? We're getting it at instants in time. We're, so we're observing it at a moment, 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 okay? And so we have to go to that definition for this for this to work. All right? Can you say that's an instantaneous velocity? It is an instantaneous velocity. Yeah. Why is it the line? That's a good question. <laughs> I didn't put it up there. So yeah, instantaneous, instantaneous. Right. And that's the definition for rolling. Okay. So somebody give me the definition for slipping. Ah, uh -huh. uh -huh. right. Zero. My eraser. <laughs> just zeros. <laughs> he just throws zeros up there. When it down, when down, incorporate the zero vector. Right. So for for slipping, it's this: the velocity of bn defined as the velocity of nb okay, in the any frame. Okay, not equal. So rolling, slipping. And that's why you can't have rolling with slipping. Those two are mutually exclusive from each other. Okay. This is like classical logic, right? If A is not equal to B, if A is equal to B and B is not equal to C, then A cannot equal C. Okay. So when this is true, this cannot be true. You with me? I mean, this is foundational. Are yeah. You? Leslie. Yeah. I know you've gone over this. That's okay. Last class, you said the velocity of Vn in N was not zero. Oh, yeah, this is not. Yeah. Why are they equal? It's because of this. Okay, let's, let, let's do this. Okay, all right. So, last class was all about slipping. Okay, this is rolling. Okay, so this is here's Monday. Here's Wednesday. Okay, ignore Wednesday. Okay, we'll go to slipping. Okay, and in slipping, let's do this, and we're still gonna pick a frame, right? Let's pick in as our frame. See what we're doing now? What is this? Zero, zero right? That's zero, and we're saying the velocity of B in 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 is not zero. That's a good question. That's a great question, right? That's confusing. It can't be confusing. Last class was all slipping. Okay, and I didn't give you a formal definition of slipping. Okay, now I've given you a formal definition of slipping. Okay, because it's actually a corollary to the definition of rolling. Right? Yeah. Okay, here's the statement, here's the corollary. Is it instantaneous as well? Slipping? Yes, yes. And why is it instantaneous? Same point. It's not the same. What do you mean, same points? NB and BN. NB and BN are not the same points. There's something fundamentally that we started with on Monday that said this has to be instantaneous. They're in contact. Okay. We're now talking about contact kinematics. Okay. And when you have contact kinematics, it's instantaneous by definition. Right. That's, this is the weirdest thing that we're going to do until next week. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. No, it's, it's but next week is cool. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, ruin everything there. All right. So pull up in your computers. Let's figure out how to put this in motion, Genesis. Okay. Instantaneous. Just take like a corner points and points and points and points <laughs> is that not, is that, what is not uh, something that's so analog versus digital right can you take a bunch of digital and make it analog 
Yeah. <laughs> hey, Jack's got Jack's got a good question. This is this is a, a fundamental foundational question here. Jack's saying, like, well, why can't it be continuous? Can't we just take enough points and make it continuous? And I said no. All right. So, so you can't do that. You've got discrete things that happen, right? There's an instant that occurs, and then you've got continuous continuous signals. Okay. And I, I tend to think about this as signals. Okay. What's the difference between analog and digital? Anybody? Y'all. Double E's of X is in the class. So, yeah, so we, we tend to think about analog as being, right, analog is, is something that the, the waves look continuous, okay? And digital, we can start to approximate an annual, an, an, an analog signal. But how do you have to do it? Right, you have to fit a bunch of square waves to it, okay? Digital is binary. Uh, we're dealing with zeros and ones. There's gates, transistors, right? Gates are on and off, okay? Um, and those gates are on and off instantaneously, okay? It's there or it's not, right? Contact is one of these things. There's a velocity that's there, and it's only good for that moment, okay? Just like a digital gate, right? A digital gate is good only for that moment because the next moment, Whatever how the moment is defined, it can be defined in seconds, right? If you've got a, say, a frequency of one hertz, right? If you've got a frequency of two hertz, it's every half second, right? So now we're starting to split things up into increments. And dt, when we write ddt, right, we're saying this is continuous, smooth over a time. All right, so there are two. Funnily different things. I mean, that's why, that's why, and I think here in, um, in our math department, there is a discrete algebra class. And discrete algebra looks different than just like the algebra that you learned uh, in high school and so forth. Okay. I'll kind of leave that at that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it makes sense, but it does, there's a difference to be so small. That it yeah. Well, so it, like it's only technically that it can't be continuous, but it, you get to a point where it might as well be representative. Yeah. So when you're making, so now we're getting into measurements. So how do you measure things? Um, how do you observe things? And so in measurements, um, we have, we do have um, a desire to, uh, to, to sample as frequently as, as, well, you want to sample as frequently as needed. And I don't want to go into a signals and systems class. By the way, a bunch of ME students, like there's a great signals and systems class here. Okay, Dr. Stefanovich teaches it. It's, it's just wonderful. This is where you get into all those things. So with your signals, discrete signals, analog signals, you know, how often do you need to sample for you to have to preserve the signal that you've got without <coughs> aliasing? There's something called the Nyquist criteria. I mean, like if you to do experiments, you have to consider all this stuff. Now it's really interesting because now a lot of this mattered a lot more 40 years ago when computers were like then it took up rooms. Okay. Actually, that was longer than 40 years ago. Because you get memory issues. Now in your, you know, our cell phone. Right, that's got way more memory and way more power than any of those computers. So you had to have these trade-offs. What do you actually need? Now we can sample at just unbelievably high rates. So there's a there's kind of a merging of what's continuous and not. Okay. But in physics, which is where we're at right now, which is not uh, this is not experimental physics. Okay, this is actually theoretical physics that we're dealing with. There is a clear distinction between something that's instantaneous and something that's analog. Okay, so I can I can understand the tension that, that you feel, especially as an experimentalist. Like, well, psh, if I just sample it enough, I'm good. <laughs> right, I get it. Okay, all right, let's do this in motion justice. All right, let's pull open that starter code. All right, so I've got you started here. In, oh, oh, one more thing, one more thing. Uh, that's two dimensions, right? Two dimensions, we end up taking a dot product with NX because we had NX. Okay, once you start doing three dimensions, okay, whether we're spinning, right, we're, we've got a rolling constraint like this, you do the same thing. There's still a velocity equation, right? You work it out. You've got a much more complex angular velocity, which we also don't have up here anymore. Okay, 
And when doing this same equation, you end up with a mix of NXs and NYs and Bs and all that kind of stuff, right? Does that make sense? So we ended up dotting with this direction. And so once we get into three dimensions, but what is it that's causing the rolling from, from where we started this discussion? Friction. Friction, right? Friction force. Friction force is a shearing force, right? And so the friction force, right? If we take away this, this ground, then we have to draw a friction force right here. We have to draw a normal force right here. So because we wanted the effect of that friction force, we chose to dot that with NX. It wasn't just a convenient choice because it's all we had. I mean, it was, right? It was pragmatic. But because I wanted the effect of that force, right? I dotted it in the NX direction. Make sense? All right, so if this is a sphere and it's rolling and I want to get pure rolling, then I'm going to have a couple of options to do my dot product with. I'm going to have my in X direction and what are, what are the directions? Not in Y. There's friction in this direction and there's also friction in the in Z direction. Okay, because it's preventing it from roll, preventing it from slipping in both of those directions. Okay, does that make sense? So all you do for three-dimensional problems, just basically speaking, is you choose a different dot product. That gives you a different scalar equation, and that gives you <coughs> another constraint in your additional dimensions. Okay. All right, so let's program that in. So um, in the template that I sent you, the other day, and this is a rigid body template. There was a new category in there that we didn't have before. And so that new category is define motion constraints when needed. Okay, and that's where this work is gonna go, right? And so, and we'll do more with it later. But let's let's work through this. Can y'all see this? We get on the screens. Okay, so I've got the rotate negative from N to B, okay, constant R, We've got uh, x double dot, we've got theta double dot. And so, so we're set up for this problem. So, so let's define our geometry and our translational kinematics for this. Okay, so for this, we have to come up with what to do about point BO. So what does this look like, point BO? Translational kinematics of BO. Translational. Translate. Kinematics. Okay, good. All right, so translate. Okay, where are we starting? Give me, give me a position vector. Okay, yeah, you know, great. All right, so starting, and then position vector is. X in and X plus we got here in O to B O R in the N Y R in the N Y. Okay, good. Is that capital R right? Yeah, and it doesn't matter in this program, right? So oh, we're okay. not case sensitive in it. Cool. Okay. All right, so that's one. We got our B B O. What are the point do we care about? Yeah, B1. So we're going to do the same thing, right? So B1, we're going to start somewhere. B1, translate. Let's start at where? BN? We don't have a BN yet. we got to do BO, right? Why are we doing translate not Not what did you say? Oh, good question. So I, I want to do translate because I want the first order, the first time derivative and second time derivative. Okay, that's what the translate does. You got set position, it only sets the configuration. Set position velocity sets the configuration and its first time derivative or its change in time. And then translate gives us all the way to acceleration. So this we've got R in the BX direction, right? BY direction. Whoops, BY direction. Okay. And then we got one more to do. BN. Good. Right. Oh, whoops. Thank you. That will matter. 
Okay, so then we've got uh, Bn. So what are we doing here? Oops, I did forget one more thing. B1 is a point on B. Okay, so put that, it's a point on B, on the object B. And that means it's going to go use that uh, derivative free equation. All right, so now Bn, where are we going to start at? Good. So negative R in the NY. And then we're going to tell it it's got to be on B. Okay, so we're just putting all this together. So let's press stop. Let's run this, make sure this works. Um, oh, it's R in Y. So R times in Y. Okay. All right, so now let's define our motion constraints. Okay, so now our motion constraints that we did, shoot, we don't have it up here anymore, okay? Our motion constraints said this, the velocity, of, because it's rolling, the velocity of BNNN -N is equal to the velocity of NBNN, -N, okay? So we came up with that equation, which just said the velocity of BNNN -N is equal to zero, okay? That was our motion constraints. So for our motion constraint, or that, that set up our vector equation. So we're going to do this. We're going to do get velocity. Okay, and that just says go get it. Right? And it's going to be get velocity of B in N N. So if we go get that velocity, it's going to give us See what it does give us. It gave us x dot minus r theta dot in the nx direction. Okay, does that look familiar? Yeah, we calculated that. Great, done. Now, remember, what we then had to do is we had to solve it. We had to do two things there. Okay, we've got an x dot minus r theta dot in the nx direction. What's the first thing we're going to do? We're going to dot it with an X. Okay. So let's fill that out. So dot product of this in the NX direction. All right, so we're one step closer. And now I've got the result is X dot minus R of theta dot. We're good here? All right. So now that I've got the dot product, right, that is our rolling constraint. So I want you to call this result, just save it as rolling constraint, okay? It's a scalar equation now, okay? Our rolling constraint is a scalar equation. Now, when we actually use it, I said just a moment ago, well, first off, we solved for it, right? We said x dot is equal to r theta dot. Yeah, this is what we're after, x dot is equal to r theta dot. So by doing this, we need to replace x dot. And so the way to do that is we need to solve this equation. And so we're going to solve it by using solve. And I'm going to solve the rolling constraint. And remember, do you remember this where it's implied is it equal to zero? You don't even have to put the equal zero there. You can if you want. Okay. But it's implied is equal to zero, and I want to solve it for x dot. Let's run that. Okay, now, what we've done here is by solving, it's assigning x dot. So now if I type in x dot, I now have a definition. Can you see at the very bottom? I now have a definition that x dot is equal to r theta dot. Which is where we, oh gosh, guys, I'm sorry. We're way over. I didn't realize that. All right, then do a DT, and then you get the rest of it. They signal me when we're just like having so much fun, it goes way over. I didn't know if it's roots or not. What's that? I didn't know if it's roots to say that. You know, you can say that. Please say it. All right. Stop Tell, Tell, Tell Roni it's my fault. Stop. One question. <laughs> 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 instantaneous. <laughs> 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 